Tune in every Tuesday to the Learning with Lowell podcast with me, your host, Lowell, to hear world-class scientists, startup founders, CEOs, and authors, people who you wouldn't normally hear about but are making huge waves all the same. You'll understand them and their work by hearing their passion, laughter, advice, and hearing them, the experts, break down what they're working on so that you can learn, push the boundaries of your knowledge, and understanding. Today, we're joined with Peter out at the VIS Institute. He is a technology development fellow championing the transitioning of technology into companies and and developing them in the lab as well. He is extremely passionate about ELMs or engineered living materials. And in this episode, we get into the strengths and weaknesses of them, biofilms, book recommendations, his thoughts on the future, where he he got interested in them. Uh, You name it, like anything ELM or this like biomaterial space is what we get into in this episode. Anyone who's, you know, if you just heard ELM, engineered living materials, and you're like, oh, that's kind of weird, listen in, because this this guy knows what he's talking about, and you'll learn all about it by the end of this. And uh, remember to check the show notes, and subscribe, and leave a review. Thank you, everybody, and let's get into this. You got your PhD at Rice University. You've been developing biomaterials and biofilms and that type of thing. And so I'm curious, as a technical development fellow for the the WIS Institute, I'm curious, like, what does that actually entail and why are you doing it? The V's technology development fellow position, basically what they do is they take things that are being developed in an academic lab, an academic setting, and they try to, to push that towards translation for commercial output, basically. Kind of take things from the lab and try to see if it has legs in industry, essentially. And so it's, it's definitely a unique position, especially made for the V's Institute, where there's a lot, the V's is kind of, you know, it's got one, one foot in academia because it's pushing out all these high impact papers. And it has the other foot in trying to make that translational, trying to bring all of these technologies to, you know, to the ground level, to, to people where they can use it. And so it's, it's different than a normal postdoc. A normal postdoc, you kind of just focus on academia. What are these experiments that I can do to make this splashy paper that has a high impact in the academic field? But you don't take that one step further. And in the V's tech fellow position, you do take that one step further. You work with business development people. You're looking at, okay, what's the, what's the market look like for if I were to make this into a product? You work with IP people, looking at what's the intellectual property landscape? How competitive are you? And so it's, it adds on multiple new dimensions for you to work through your science with. And the second part of your question is why me? Well, I mean, because I'm interested in this technology. Um, so every technology needs a champion, right? If you have a technology, unless market forces are just waiting for that to drop in and there's a huge need for it, usually you're going to need somebody to champion it. You basically need somebody where it's, this is my baby. And I'm going to try to get it out there. I'm going to try to, to you know, get this as much media attention as possible, try to get funding in, try to get companies interested in partner, partnering to get this technology out. And so I developed the, the ELMs when I was a postdoc. And it was just a natural transition to see if it does have legs for any kind of commercial development. What, what originally drew you to the ELMs? And for, for people uh, listening in, it's um, engineered living materials. So, so this goes all the way back to my graduate career at Rice, where as a, as a budding scientist, I was really interested in synthetic biology, which is the, you know, the ability to re-engineer life to kind of create what you want. It's new drugs, new life forms. That's the, the, one of the, the, the goals of synthetic biology. And what I was also really interested in was materials engineering, kind of building things. I, I, I'm, personally, I really like to build things and fix things. Even if, you know, things in the lab, things like a car, a house, whatever, it, it, it feels good to, to fix and build things to me. And that's something that I was always interested in is engineering materials. And in graduate school, I wasn't really focused on that. And for my postdoc, I wanted to, you know, a, a postdoc gives you the freedom to say, hey, you know, this, this area I'm really interested in, but I'm, I'm technically weak in this area. I want to get better at it. So I'm going to spend a few years focused on getting better in this area, as well as, you know, generating papers for the the lab that you're in. So for the materials part, we were already kind of focused on the the concept of self-assembly, which is you have basically, you have all these components and they will just find each other like a Lego piece and start to build a material. 
And one way it's described, one way to think about it is, okay, imagine building a car. It, it's on an assembly line, part after part gets put on until at the very end, you have a fully finished car, right? So assembly is basically like putting all the parts in a room, throwing it together, and the parts all magically assemble. Know where, the, know where each part goes. And at the end of the day, you have this self-assembling car. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the idea of self-assembly. And, and on the biological scale, that self-assembly is, in terms of self-assembly materials, it's, it's a really cool thing to think of. And so what got me interested is just the idea, you know, if you sit back and you think about it, all of us came from a single cell, right? Single cell that sat in your mom for nine months, feeding basically on her energy, essentially. But that one cell, you think about it, it's the nucleus, it's, you know, cytoplasm, it's just single cell. It's not very exciting. But there's all the information in that one cell to basically gather energy from the environment and create what you are now. And you're like this walking assembly of bones and eyes and, you know, hair and all these crazy materials. I mean, so thinking about biology in terms of self-assembling materials, it was the lens that I kind of wanted to focus on. And I wanted to focus on, okay, what can we do to create self-assembling materials that are generated by biology? Because biology can self-replicate. It's very robust, essentially. And so the, the thing that we initially focused on as a postdoc in my lab, I was in Neil Joshi's lab as a postdoc at the V's as well, was amyloids. So amyloids, people have heard about amyloids in terms of Alzheimer's. And essentially, it's a self-assembling disease. You have these little bits that aren't supposed to come together in the brain, but they do. And they start to form these clumps. And so that's a self-assembly process. And unfortunately, in terms of Alzheimer's and even Parkinson's, there's some amyloids associated with that. You don't want that process because as they start to build up in your brain, there's no way to get rid of them. And so it's a runaway self-assembly process that is bad, right? But can we use those same properties of amyloids to make actual materials? And so it's interesting that we only think of amyloids in terms of Alzheimer's and, and patho pathogenic disease, but in nature, it's actually pretty widespread. And nature has different organisms have found ways to use amyloids in a beneficial way. Because if you think about it, you have a bunch of parts. It takes energy to kind of put them together to figure out what you want in the end, right? But what if you have these parts and they already know how to find each other and assemble? Then you don't have any energy. You, you basically just make the parts and they, they come together, right? And so nature has found a way to use amyloids, exploit that for the, the benefit of the organism. And one way that bacteria do it, so a, a lot of the times it says synthetic biology, we focus on bacteria because they're the simplest thing that we can engineer. They're easy to grow. They grow fast. You don't really care if they die, that kind of stuff. So the bacteria we use actually do create amyloids. So everybody has, has encountered biofilms before. So when you brush your teeth in the morning, before you brush your teeth, if you run your, you know, your tongue over your mouth, that slimy filling is biofilm that's been growing throughout the night in your mouth. And we see biofilms on the sidewalks. It's, it's all the icky stuff that you don't want to touch, basically. Every time you see something slimy, that's probably a biofilm being formed. And the biofilm is there for the bacteria to protect itself. And part of that biofilm is essentially the self-assembling amyloids. So these, these bacteria will sit there and they will spit out amyloids that self-assemble around them, kind of, like, um, kind of like making your own rebar around yourself. And it basically protects the bacteria from predators and it protects it from, from getting swept away. And so they do make these amyloids and they form these, they're basically like big chains of, of rebar that, that kind of uh, hold the bacteria in place. And what we wanted to do was see if we can engineer that on the genetic level. So now we know that little building block that forms th this amyloid chain. Can we add stuff to it and alter the, the properties of that chain now? Can we turn this from rebar into something else that has other properties? And so what we wanted to do was find a way where we can engineer the bacterium so that now I can, I can make a material that has a certain property. It can, for example, bind to gold. You can use it for remediation of metals in the environment. Or it can bind, it can actually display an enzyme that, you know, it normally doesn't display at all. 
and now you can make a, a material that has catalytic properties, has chemical properties that normally it doesn't have. And so, you know, the, the very inspiration for this is, can we take something that is detrimental, a biofilm, and can we turn it on its head and say, look, biofilms in nature, it's something we fight against as humans. You know, every time you get a biofilm, it might be infectious and persistent in your body. Can we take that system that the bacteria use and re-engineer that now for, to use for our, our own purposes, which is building materials on a molecular scale using synthetic biology? Is there an application of it that you're really excited to develop? So some of the applications I, I dream of are very sci-fi far in the future. And it's things like, can we use these biofilms, for example, uh, on Mars? Can we integrate this with a photosynthetic organism now, where you harvest the energy from the sun and it spits out this material that you can program to do whatever you want. It could be an adhesive, it could be something like concrete, et cetera. And can you combine that with whatever resources you have at, at Mars, for example, to build habitats? So imagine the living components actually making this stuff for you. You can't, you know, if you're on Mars or, or somewhere that's resource limited, you, you can't just go to Home Depot and, and buy things to, to assemble what you want, right? But if you have a living thing that can self-replicate and you can actually program it to form into what you want in terms of the kind of materials you want, then I think that that raises a lot of possibilities. And there are efforts in the lab right now. So this is efforts in Neil Joshi's lab that are ongoing. Um, it's kind of sp split off a bit from, from the, the kind of materials I was thinking of, but now they're looking at, can we use this programmable material to actually form programmed material that lives in your gut that you can use to either patch, patch gut diseases or to actually use as a drug depot. So now we're, we're, we're taking that, that living material and we're seeing if we can actually have it live inside of us and use it for our benefit, which is, I think is, is a fantastic and a really far out there idea, but they've already done this in mice. And the next step, obviously, is see if it, if it works with, with humans as well. Yeah, so, you know, the, the Mars thing, there's, we published a paper showing that you can use these pro programmable biofilms to actually suck mercury out of, out of the water. So there's still a lot of development that needs to be done. I forget the, the series name, but they had organic ships, and they would be somewhat alive, and you'd just kind of, instead of having strictly metal vehicles, they would be organisms, which is kind of crazy. As a question of itself, do you ever see it advancing to the point where we can make boats or actual things like that? Or is it always going to be kind of rebar or structural type things? I think if you wanted to make something, so, I mean, you bring up a really interesting point. So for something, for example, like a ship, right? That's very structurally complex. If you think about it, a tree is kind of structurally complex too, right? You, you have a trunk, you have roots, it has a certain architecture for it to, to gather sunlight. And yet all of that came from a single seed. It had all the ingredients to, to make wood and to form what it morphologically should be, which is a tree, right? For us to get to that point, I think is gonna take much longer beyond my lifetime, many, many years. Because right now we're, okay, we can make these basic materials and it's programmable, which is you know really cool and interesting. But to go from that to something that knows I need to be a, a ship or I need to be, you know, a chair, that requires a lot of more engineering in, term, in terms of self-organizing morphology. And that's, that's a huge thing that I think we haven't even scratched the surface of, to be honest. That's, that's something that's exciting a lot of people in synthetic biology, but it's, it's, it's a huge unsolved issue, basically. Pretty exciting, though. So I imagine one of the things you could do to get to that point is you could 3D print scaffolding and then have the organisms grow on that and then do other functions so maybe it can't do the entire thing but it could do like some of the things then over time we could have a whole thing either way it's just an exciting thing especially in the last last couple hundred years as we've been industrializing more and more and more we've relied on mortar and you know rebar and these very interesting things but before the, that time we we always relied on biology to, to like to take care of us and so i think moving forward using this con conjunction of material and biology especially especially like you said it so well like they were they repair themselves whenever you're doing something it's going to last longer because it's going to be able to take care of itself versus needing every couple of years to swap it out i think uh just if you were to do something with roads you know like i, I live in i lived in illinois and there's like a, a season where people just put up traffic cones and like it's kind of a joke that like 
it's it's uh traffic re- road repair season where like they're always repairing the roads because I, I swear like just for years and years they always repair it and then they'll fix they'll they'll finish the road and they'll just redo it again but um so like by, Is it by also, or? no they just all like they, I, I, I it just always feels like they're doing construction on all the roads like all the main oh. arteries and stuff like yeah like I, I i mean i was up there for like 20 some years and the last I don't know, five to 10 when I was traveling all around, there's always were cones up doing stuff. Not yeah. even just like, re- like removing and then um, adding huge strips of road. But that, maybe that, that's Illinois for you. They're, we're kind of weird. The, the traffic cones and then governors who go to jail are like what we're kind of known for, the, <laughs> at least for the last 20 years. But going with this future thing about what ELMs can do, are there, are there particular weaknesses that they just can't do? Like the applications that you think they won't be able to? I mean, I would love to have a world where every material is grown. We, we basically exit the cycle of inorganic construction and assembly and just have everything, all the materials live with us. One of the biggest detractors currently, I'd say, is just time scale. for example. I'll give you, and, and I think this is, this is actually due to the way we live as humans. Everything, of course, we want things now, right? You, you, you go to a car dealership, you buy a car, you don't wait a year for the factory to assemble it. You, you want it now. And I think the same thing kind of highlights one weakness of ELMs is that it's, if it's a living thing, things actually don't grow that fast. So you might think the biofilm in your shower grows pretty damn quickly, but to be honest, it, it might take a week or two or, or even months for that to happen. And so imagine how long it takes a tree to grow to the point where you can turn it into rafters. It, it, it's going to take decades for that. Whereas, okay, now if I made that rafter out of steel, I mean, you, you basically just melt the steel and, and you have that there. And it might take maybe a couple of days for you to, to put it in place. And so the engineered living materials have the benefit of being self-renewing, programmable, living, maybe even drawing out certain energy from the environment, such as you know living off sunlight, for example. But in terms of growth, it really doesn't grow fast enough to kind of do some of the things that we want in terms of the material, everyday materials that we need. And so that, that I think is, is one of the primary weaknesses. And one of the other weaknesses is control over the process. So right now, we're just kind of entering into this, this area where we can program living things to make materials for us. But the hard thing is that's kind of like a garden. If you plant things in your garden, you come back and hopefully everything that you planted you know, grows, but you also have to make sure that it doesn't grow beyond the confines of your garden. And you want to make sure that you weed out your garden and things like that. So just like a garden, it it requires maintenance. Any living thing requires maintenance. If you leave it alone and come back a year later, your garden is probably not going to be what you want it to be. Right. And so a programmed living thing to make materials is similar to that. There it, it living things don't know when to quit. And so kind of programming that in either internally where it says, all right, I'm, I'm done making this structure or this material. I'm going to kill myself now so that I don't grow anymore. That is something that we can engineer in or a lot of people, what they have looked towards is some kind of external thing where after you created your structure, you throw it in the oven and you bake it and it kills all the living components. And all you're left with that after that is the, the, the leftover biological materials. Um, that are non-living wouldn't there be the jurassic park third option where you, where you make them chemically dependent their growth chemically dependent on an environment like in that example it's really bad because the, the 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 protein that they made them dependent on was something that was found in all organisms but i think george church he came out with um, some research where he made yeast chemically dependent so it wouldn't proliferate if it didn't have like this type of nutrient storms so if you if you made them if you were like hey grow and then you kind of calculated out like you know, if you give them like 10 grams of this, they'll make a one inch by one inch thing. And so then they just kind of grow to that level. Would that be like a third option between killing themselves, being killed by an environmental cue and just being limited? Right. I, I think that's a fantastic third option. It kind of goes under the umbrella of kind of an external way to kind of force them to die. I mean, actually, our lab, you know, is right next to George Church's lab. And we have actually started doing some re- some research into limiting um, these engineered living materials, especially the ones that we're, we're developing for the gut uh, in the Joshi lab. And so the idea is if you have these 
this matrix in the gut that's a material made by these living organisms and they're genetically engineered, you don't want them to escape into the environment, you know, and obviously you flush it down the toilet, it, that's escaping into the environment. And so the biocontainment system that the church lab developed would be fantastic for that. So the cells would only grow if it had this special chemical added in. And otherwise, if you leave out that, that little chemical, then all the cells die. And so, yeah, you could, you could totally potentially do that. And you could think about having a system where you 3D print a scaffold, like you mentioned before. You put it in a vat with a special chemical and the, the, the scaffold allows the cells to arrange themselves into the right material you want. Have them grow happily for a couple of days, scoop it out, and then the cells should all die because they don't have those chemicals uh, behind, uh, around them anymore, yeah. Is there an option to, instead of just let, letting them die to, they would just go inert or dormant until they reactivated with the, the chemical in the future? Or, or, or there's a line of thinking right now just to have them die off because then it's like more clean and then you could just reintroduce more in the future. Yeah, so I mean, th I think that's a really interesting line of inquiry. So one thing that we've thought about is these bacterial cells, you know, they're, they're always active when they have nutrients. But we, what you can do is you can actually make them dormant. You can actually make them form spores. And these spores are, are incredibly hardy. They're, they're resistant to desiccation. They're resistant to even radiation. And so if you use the kind of bacteria that can readily form these spores, it would actually go inert until it was reactivated. Maybe by we can engineer it to become reactivated by a certain chemical. And so if you needed the material to heal, there would be these leftover spores essentially that would activate themselves at the time that you need it to by adding a certain chemical so I, I think that's something nobody's developed before and i think that's some pretty exciting stuff there you're talking about embedding materials with 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 nano machines factories that you can just call on at will which is you know that's pretty pretty cool stuff just to point out how you're underselling how robust spores are there's a a, a lady out in corpus christi Texas, who, mm -hmm. who found spores in the Earth's crust that the surrounding sediment was like 45 million years old. And she, she, took, she took some and was able to reactivate them. And they were, you know, still fine and not destroyed by being in the crust uh, so deep and, you know, existing for 45 million years. So they're like, um, just for people listening in, very, very robust organisms these spores are. Yeah, 45 million years. That's, uh, and it's still keep going the, so it's really interesting the apparently like the spores like every now and again one spore will basically like self like like kill itself to let everyone else know if it's good to to grow so it'll be like hey i'm gonna like send out a shoot and if it, the environment kills this thing everyone else is like okay well we're not gonna go join jeb and yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's cool named jeb i like that yeah uh, i was i probably played too much kerbal space program so i, I can't ever get beyond the moon um, yeah, I just wanted to point out like spores are just very, very robust. So you, you mentioned the weaknesses. We've seen some strengths, kind of have a sense of what you want to see going forward. So for people who have been interested in what we've been talking about so far, and they think this is something they want to get involved in, are there, are there ways that are coming up that, that it would be easier for people, maybe like postdocs like yourself or people in their PhD to start moving over towards ELMs to work on this? Because it's a very... I think there's a, a good saying where you should go where the hockey puck is going versus where mm -hmm. it is. And so if ELMs are in the, you know, in the development stage and they have this great potential, then if you get in now, as, as it grows, you'll be at the top of the pyramid versus at the bottom doing boring stuff with everyone else. Uh, so uh, <laughs> basically, how, how, how can people get involved in this? So let me start with the postdoc level first, which is kind of the level of, of your, your, you know, a PhD scientist at that point. There, there, there are two camps, basically. So ELMs kind of sits in this weird interdisciplinary region right between synthetic biology and materials science. And you can approach ELMs from either, either camp. So you can be a synthetic biologist where you're engineering life forms and you, know, you, you move towards looking at materials. And so for that, you need, you need certain, certain expertise in materials characterization, for example which is like, for example, electron microscopy, or even uh, biophysics of materials, things, things, like, things like that. 
And so you would have to basically shore up your expertise in that area. And the converse goes if you're a material scientist and you know all about materials and how to build materials and you want to get into ELMs, then obviously you have to learn about genetic engineering and uh, synthetic biology and that sort. And more often than not, the, the best way as a postdoc to do that quickly is to find somebody that has those complementing, ex the complementing expertise that you need and form a team. And it's, you know, it's great that most of the, the people that are working on ELMs today, they're multidisciplinary teams, maybe half a dozen people all over the world, you know, working on this kind of stuff. And so I think that for the postdoc level is kind of the, the, the most practical way to go about things. And for example, if you were an undergraduate student or maybe a graduate student or even a high school student, there are ways to get involved in synthetic biology that are open to, to anyone as long as you can, you know, kind of marshal the resources to go find it. iGEM is one. It is synthetic biology competition. There, the past couple of years, there's been several teams that have done ELM-like projects. And for those, of, for those out there that don't know, iGEM is basically a competition held every year where students, teams that are undergraduate students or even high school students get together uh, that work on a project that is synthetic biology based, which is you know, bioengineering, to, to do all kinds of things. Like one, one team one year made a therapeutic for HIV, for example, and you can basically do whatever you want. Think of it as, think of it as a high school science fair project on steroids. And, and basically, it's, it's a fun time. I was involved in it in graduate school. And of course, there are citizen science things that are popping up all over the place now. These are biological laboratories that are open to the community for you to learn. You might have heard of it called as biohacking. And so that, those are easy ways to just kind of get involved in synthetic biology get the, the genetic engineering under your belt. And then at that point, moving on to materials should be your focus. Is there any opportunity for business people or people that maybe don't have the science background or have the science aptitude, but are equally excited about this technology and these types of things that they could find a way into being helpful and a good resource for this stuff as it develops? Absolutely. There are a few startups actually that are in this ELM space. And a lot of these people, you know, they're not trained scientists. They, they do these things at, at home or, or in their own lab, even, in order to get started. And I think the key thing is finding, finding a way for it to be self-sustaining in terms of it being a commercial enterprise. Like, where, what's your target market going to be? And I think a fantastic example of where, what the potentials of ELM are and how you can actually get this, the ball rolling without really being an academic scientist is this company called Ecovative. And essentially, they, they create large-scale materials out of fungus. And this is fungus that grows, that feeds on, on wood. So it's, it's a type of wood-rotting fungus, basically. And what these people basically do, what Ecovative does, is they have a template. Let's say I want to form a, a vase, right? They will have a mold for that. And they will feed fungus wood chips and the fungus, as it, grow, as it feeds on these, these wood chips, it, the whole body of the fungus forms the actual bulk of the material itself. And then at the end of the day, you, you throw it in the oven and you kill off the, any cells so that all you have left is a vase. I mean, they, they sell kits. You can do this at home. This is fantastic. They, they, give you, they give you the starter culture of the fungus. They give you the feed that you're supposed to give it and a mold. And then you go home and you do it and you make your own whatever you want, basically. And, you know, that, that self-growing fungus, you see this, this kind of biohacking or getting involved in biology without the need for a PhD or even a really sophisticated lab. You can easily do it at home. And again, that's, that's how robust nature is. You, you, can, you can take this and do it at home. If, if you have the wherewithal to garden, where you take in an organic thing, seeds, you're putting it and you're, you're feeding it, you're watering it, then you can do ELMs at home. It's, it's, to me, they're kind of one in the same. And the company you just named, they were one of the, from the, I don't think, I didn't see any other companies on the list, but DARPA has an ELM program right now. I don't know, sometimes people associate DARPA with negative things, but DARPA invented the internet. Like there's a lot of positive things that come out of DARPA. Yeah, DARPA invented a lot of things that sustain you know, our country. So the fact that they're really interested to the point of funding 
all of these ELM research programs. I think that that says a lot in terms of the potential for this technology. Yeah. So the, the stuff's going out there, getting out there. Um, one thing that I, this is why I really like the New Harvest. They do cellular agriculture. It's about the, the conference that's coming up in July. For everyone who's in, interested in cellular agriculture that's near Boston should check it out. And what I like about them is that they are basically doing a lot of the research and then open sourcing the patents to some extent so that like it doesn't get really closed off with a couple of people that come in early. Are you, because this is so burgeoning in that way, are, are, is there a concern on your, uh, that you have that a similar thing could happen where like a couple of companies come in and they get some of the core IP and then it's hard for newcomers to come in? I think we're, we're still in, in such the early, the, the stages right now for ELMs is so early. You only have a smattering of companies, but I, I think there is a risk for that because in every field where there, there's the potential to make money, IP becomes the key thing that you need. And so companies will fight over it. Companies will put up roadblocks. And to me, if that starts to happen, that's a bad thing because obviously it has a chilling effect on the pro- progression of the technology. But that also is actually an indication that people are, are interested in the potential for the technology itself. And so it's good in a way, but it's also bad if it, if it hurts the progression itself. But right now, most of, it, most of this is in academia in terms of the genetically engineered ELMs. So for example, the Ecovative one, they're using natural fungus and it's just their their process that they're doing. It'd be really interesting to see how the IP landscape evolves in terms of getting things getting licensed out by companies. So right now it's just drumming up interest from companies that I think is the the key goal. Do you see yourself going the startup route or are you going to do more of the academia route? Or I guess right. you could, kind of what George Church and Bob Langer, where they like they run their own department, but they also help bunt out a lot of companies at the same time. So you do like a in the middle route as well. The, the academic route obviously would be becoming a professor and running a, my own academic lab. And that has its own responsibilities in terms of like what you're supposed to do. High impact papers, get grants, things like that. And, you know, it would be fantastic to see if I can, I can, form a startup using ELM technology. And I would be really interested in that. It's just a matter of finding that right application where I can obviously see the the commercial and societal benefit for developing this into a particular thing, for example. And so right now it's still in the early academic stages in terms of like trying to fill out how competitive this technology will be compared to what's already out there. And, And like I said before, there's a lot that needs to be developed and implemented before it's, it's on the level with what we have out there for the materials that we already, we already have and need. So I guess that was a long-winded way of, of answering your question, which is we'll see what the future holds. I don't have you know, this clear path in my head yet. And right now it's a matter of just kind of testing the landscape for where ELMs can go when it gets out of the lab basically. Makes sense. Like you're going to be developing yourself and the industry by staying in the academia. And then yep. as time goes on, you have like the option to form your own company and then go right. the, the ELM DARPA route. Though um, there's also SBIRs and stuff. So um, for people who don't know what that stuff is, I'll write about that in a different post. Because um, <laughs> it'd be a thing in itself. It's, uh, they have like an entire website uh, dedicated to explain what those are. So for the next like, for the next five years, how do you see things developing? That's a great question. So next five years for ELMs, I see a definite trend. I mean, we've already seen a few papers come out from other groups looking at this. Trends kind of integrating ELMs with 3D printing, which you mentioned earlier. You mentioned earlier. And, and they kind of need to go hand in hand because as I said before, we don't have a way right now to program things to form a complex structure. And so you need something like 3D printing to kind of impose that from the top down. You know, you're, so now you're programming it with a machine and the, 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 uh, the cells are just little factories kind of taking in cues from your 3D printed structure and making something. And so I see a lot of inroads in that particular combination of technologies, ELMs and 3D printing. And I think that that's going to be pretty exciting. One other aspect that, for example, the Joshi Lab and a couple of other people are kind of looking into this is going more the biomedical route. So these are engineered materials now. Can we somehow make them 
biomedically active, so for some beneficial purpose. And, and a lot of people are interested in that research as well. And I, I think one thing that nobody has kind of done, so everybody so far pretty much has been doing this in E. coli in terms of a genetically engineered version. It would be really interesting to see us move beyond bacteria and to use more complex cells, animal cells, plant cells that can actually, you know, make more materials in a more complex manner. So, you know, I talked about humans. You can imagine your your every single cell in your body knows how to make a bone, knows how to make hair, knows, they basically know how to make this palette of materials. They just, you know, need to choose what material to make, what this kind of cell they want to be, right? And so can we have that same palette of materials and make that into an engineered programmable living material? And that's going to have applications for all kinds of things, tissue engineering, organ engineering, and, you know, maybe even you can imagine growing wood in a vat. That would be kind of cool, right? Um, and we're kind of in this area now where we're, we're, we're growing steak in a lab, we're, we're growing hamburgers in a lab, stuff like that. And how far can we push it in, in terms of materials that, would actually be useful to us? I think that's the greater question. And I think a lot of this is going to be driven again by paths to industry. So if there is a, a way for ELMs to become a market force in terms of making materials, I think at that point, when once people realize that, it's going to divert the research towards that particular thing that's going to allow that to happen. So I think these next five years, it's going to be kind of pushing the envelope of where we see the weaknesses right now. And also the market will actually dictate where the fundamental research should go as well. Makes sense. But whenever I, I hear people and what, what they're interested in and what they're excited about and what they're able to do. And so I'm, I'm curious, is there anything that you're just like horrible at? So you're, you're good at ELMs and, and developing this type of stuff. Something that I'm bad at. Maybe podcast interviews. I don't know. Uh, people <laughs> you're doing a good job. Them. <laughs> it, uh, to me, it's the same thing as what a lot of other people suffer from time management, for example, I can always be better at that. And I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, it, that's a great question because it, it made me realize, you know, I, I guess I don't really focus on my weaknesses in terms of like, you know, thinking about those things, you know, you just kind of, if you're interested in something, you, if I'm interested in something, I'll, I'll just try at it until I fail constantly and, and until I achieve what I want to do. A lot of leaders are like that. Uh, Steve Jobs was like that. I think uh, Ben Franklin was like that. It's like a, I think it's a mark of like entrepreneurship where you don't, you don't overly focus on negatives or, or uh, setbacks. You just learn from them. Uh, if it doesn't like overly register versus some people who if something negative happens, like they, like they ruminate on it pretty substantively. Well, uh, yeah, I think that might be an entrepreneurial spirit, but it, I can see there would be many characteristics where that would be very bad. You might have a megal megalomaniac out there that doesn't, don't see their own faults, right? Honestly, one, one, thing, uh, one thing that I would say is a weakness, personally for me, and, and I, I understand it's a weakness, and, and I completely choose to do it, which is career development. Right now, um, I'm a research scientist at the V's. I should be looking at, you know, associate professorships, applying for that stuff. And, and you know, I will be. But that takes a, a seat, a, a backseat to what really drives me, which is, you know, working on things that make me curious. And like I said, fixing and building things. And so those kind of have to balance each other out, I guess. Career development and just being in the moment of focused on what you're working on. And I, I would say my balance is a bit off on that. I'm a lot more focused on what's in front of me, I would say. So you have the opposite of Luke Skywalker's problem at the beginning of, this is like a very, I guess, somewhat nerdy uh, reference, but at the beginning of uh, A New Hope, when he's like mm -hmm. looking off to the horizon, and then Yoda makes fun of him for always looking to the future and not to where, he, where he's at. Like you're, you're at the point where Yoda says you're supposed to be at. Yoda's, you know, being mindful of being in the present, right? Uh, and, you know, obviously it's a balance and our personalities kind of dictate which, which we, we kind of gravitate towards, but yeah, maybe I should look up every now and then. Uh, <laughs> what is it? The optimist looks up and fall at an optimist, uh, an optimist, a pessimist and a realist are walking down the road 
or on the sidewalk. I mean, if they're on the road, they're all going to die because there's cars. But so the optimist looks up in the air because they're like, oh, wow, look at the future. And they, they fall through a, a pothole or, you know, like a, like a manhole thing and they die. Yeah. They, they just get hurt. That's not a nice thing. Uh, the pessimist looks down because they're afraid of like stumbling over stuff and runs straight into a car. The realist looks straight on and avoids all the obstacles. So, may, so as long as you, I guess like, like the balance of it is probably pretty good. The other ones um, can be quite uh, can be harmful. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know a book that I recommend to anyone who's kind of feeling this way is the A Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. I think you have a good sense of what you want to be doing, but. Everyone that has read that book that I've recommended it to has, has come away with it and, and um, it's helped them, especially if you're at the point of your life where you can do whatever you want, have you know, all this potential with your education. And w- if you were to start a startup, you know that people would listen to you because you, you hopefully know, know what you're talking about. And so, like, which can kind of be hard, you know, like the, the stress of like, maybe I make the wrong decision. Though you seem to, to wear it well, you don't seem too stressed about it, but um, I'd recommend stressed that. About book. what? Again? Like, like making the wrong decision. Like do I, if I w- go left and it doesn't work out, um, some, sometimes people will get uh, afraid of failure, but right. I think, especially, uh, we talked before the interview and it, I think that I'm, this is me guessing. I don't know. I'm, I'm speaking for you, but I get the sense that like, you're not afraid of failure. If anything, you see failure as a, a process to find mastery. As a scientist, when you're doing experiments, everything, you're kind of inundated with failure because that's how you move forward in experiments. Right. So, you know, people always use that term on the cutting edge of science and stuff like that. If you really are at the forefront of science, you're at the limit of what we know. You're basically staring into the abyss. There's no roadmaps. There's no guidance. And you're fumbling in the dark to try and figure out things, essentially, things that you don't know. And that's where experiments come in. You know, the scientific experiments are that tool for us to map out things that we don't know. And most of the time, these experiments fail. But each failure, hopefully... <laughs> will give you an indication of what to do next. And so it's this constant being a scientist, collecting failures. And it could be demoralizing for someone that hasn't really done science before or done experiments before. You know, for example, if you give it to a high school student, a lab, to do an experiment. They finish the experiment and they get an A, right? And imagine if the experiment failed. Well, you get an F. And then that's, a, that's demoralizing. In the real world, you know, there's, there's no A's or F's. It's just this experiment failed. What can you learn from it? And you keep doing that until you kind of map out what's going on or build something that never existed before. And, you know, anybody that builds things or prototypes can tell you, you know, how many, how many failures are left on a workbench, right? Before you get to something that really works well. There's that really, I mean, good story with the invention of the light bulb where, um, there was like a thousand and one light bulb iterations before they found the one that made sense. And I think someone even asked Thomas Edison, like, Hey, do you feel dumb for having to take a thousand tries to get there? And he's like, Nope, I found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it works out on the, on the mindset of quotes. There's this great Arthur C. Clarke quote, which I like, which is uh, anything sufficiently advanced. I'm going to paraphrase this. Cause now I don't remember how to say yeah. it exactly. Any technology that's sufficiently advanced looks like magic to, yep. you know, so is there, is there something that you know how to do right now at your current level of understanding that to like an average person would seem like magic? I have other, other research uh, going on the V's kind of involved in, in uh, education. So these are, these are, they're called bio bits kits. These are basically bio, synthetic biology kits for high school students that we just developed this year. And that gives you an indication of kind of what people say, wow, this is, this is amazing. So right now, one of the most basic things we do in lab is transform a bacteria. And all that is, is you, you take a bacteria and you have this synthetic DNA you order from company. It's chemically synthesized. You stick it into the bacterium and then the bacterium reads that instruction, reads the, the instructions in the DNA and puts out a protein that you want essentially. So I would say one of the most basic things that we do in lab that I think a normal person would be like, wow, that's really, you know, it looks like magic would be putting in a fluorescent protein into the bacterium. So basically it makes it glow under a a certain wavelength of light. I mean, it looks, you know, looks like neon green under, under a black light. And so that's just for visual, visual impression essentially to, to, for people. But yeah, so genetic engineering is, is, is something that's pretty straightforward to do. I think anybody can do it. Uh, high school, junior high 
kids can even do it. But I, I feel like there's this cloak of mystique about, about genetic engineering. And it, it, that term, genetically engineered whatever, has its own connotations to the public. And to me, a lot of people think that I would put under, under the category of like, wow, it's, it's magical because of the, I, I guess, the, the lack of understanding of how easy it is to do. And I, I hope that's changing with current high school curricula and also an undergraduate level as well in, in terms of dispelling the, the kind of that cloak of mystery behind genetic engineering. I think there was, it was either an article in, the, in a newspaper, an article in a research journal. I don't remember where it was, but they were saying, the basic idea is that it takes about 20 years for research to go from the lab to average people knowing about it, which was weird because with CRISPR, it was like, you know, a couple of years. So it's, I think, I think I, I would be surprised if there's someone in America who, who hasn't heard of CRISPR. It's just so, so prevalent, but so before we get to the last couple of questions, I'm curious if you, because especially with someone who makes these bio kits to help educate other people, are there good books they'd recommend to check out either, either in the, with the ELM in mind, like maybe not specifically, but just like in the journal or just in general, like any books that you enjoy reading recently that people should check out. So there was a book, that you reminded me of when you were talking about Edison, there was a book about Edison and Nikola Tesla and the whole race to electrify America, essentially. And I don't remember the exact title. I have to send it to you. But that goes through, it's, it's really great because it goes through the different ways different people think. Edison's way is, you know, just kind of brute force, one after the other, hard sweat and tears and stuff like that. Whereas Nikola Tesla was a bit more elegant in terms of like, hey, let's think about this problem. Let's think our way through it rather than line up a hundred different materials and try and burn them and make a light bulb out of it, right? Um, so it, that, that was a great book for me, just looking at the great people and the way that they, they run things, how, they, they, how their minds work, things like that. But in terms of ELMs, actually one book that kind of planted the seed in my mind a long time ago, it was this book called Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler. And I read this when I was an undergrad at University of Texas. And, you know, it, it basically popularized the idea of nanomachines. You, we would have these nanobots that could break things down and then build themselves and construct whatever we wanted. And, you know, it sounds very magical, right? And basically you could have all these nanomachines in a vat and it would just take atoms and assemble a jet engine for you inside the vat. And it wouldn't know how to do all that, you know? And, and you know, I was really struck by that when I was younger. I was like, you know, this is a really cool concept. And again, it goes back to the idea of self-assembly. Can you, can you create things on the atomic level? And as, as I kind of went through my academic career, you know, going into synthetic biology, I thought about that whole jet being, making a jet engine from, from scratch in a vat. And I was like, you know what, you know, if you think about it, we make some pretty complex things in biology. From one cell, you're making an entire human being and a woman has to carry that around. It's essentially a bat, a walk, you know, a bat inside, and you're creating something infinitely more complex than a jet engine, in my opinion, a human being. And so that's the power of, of kind of this weird area where we're using cells, and then we're also looking at nanotechnology and kind of blending the two almost, because, you know, cells, they're basically factories. They are, they are nanomachines. You know, they have nanomachines in them and it's like a micron scale factory that has these nanomachines that can make pretty much whatever you want. And so Engines of Creation is, is, is a great book I would recommend. It's, it's pretty old. And I have a litany, I have a long list of books that I need to read and, and get through. I think you just added to them by, by adding a couple of books to my list. Do you tend to like the biography-esque ones like the Nikola versus Edison way of thinking? Yeah. I, I do. Um, I have several Walter Isaacson books that I have not worked my way through. I think the last one I read was the, the one that came out years ago, the one on Einstein. And it, it's a, I mean, it's just great. You, you might think of biography reads as kind of dry, but the way, the way he writes, he weaves in history. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of Walter Isaacson biographies, basically. 
I always recommend the, the one on Franklin. It's really good, especially if, if anyone's interacting with people a lot and you also want to be humbled and kind of make fun of Benjamin who went from being kind of a doofus at rating people to being like the reason that France came in because he was able to understand the culture that they wanted. It's all in there, which is fantastic. One thing I liked about the Einstein uh, Einstein book, I was surprised to learn how art- artistic he was. Mm-hmm. Like uh, every, when you think of Einstein, you think, you know, math, numbers and all that and whatnot. But when I, when I was reading and learning how much he would almost like meditate with the, the violin and to the point where he, would, he was so good that he could play concerts and stuff. I think sometimes people picture scientists as like these lab coat people that just like sit there like drawing uh, on erase boards and uh, just to like, that, it's not true. We know, we know <laughs> this, but like, I just, I love the idea of him thinking of something and, you know, getting stuck and then playing the violin to create his way around it. What I think is very beautiful. Art and science, they're, they're much more intertwined than, than people think. And the, the source of an idea in terms of art and science even, it comes from the same, same place. You know, you're, you're, you're doing these experiments in your head and you're, you're, for example, as a scientist, I'm aware of how certain things work, right? And then in my mind, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, I, what if we, d- we use this and this other thing that somebody else developed, can we make something new that does this? And so you, you're, you're constantly trying to create things in your head. And it's just like being an artist. You, you know, you know how to layer colors together. You know how to spatially arrange them. And in your head, you're wondering, well, can I make this particular composition? What will that look like? And so it's just a matter of once you have that in your head, that, it, that little inspiration, you either go to the lab and build things or you go to the canvas and paint things. And, but it, came, it comes all from the same source. A book popularized this idea by Malcolm Gladwell. It's the one where if you put 10,000 hours into something, you can become a master of it. It was found, he got the idea from a research article. And one of the things that most people, at least what Malcolm Gladwell, I believe, left out is that it's not just 10,000 hours. It's also forced training, not just spend 10,000 hours like reading blindly into something, but like forced training yourself on the math and stuff to use math as an analogy. I'm curious, have, have you considered doing some forced training on, with creativity to be better at it? No, I have not. Usually that's, again, a time issue, not, not, not having enough time, but that's, you know, I, I think that's just an excuse to be honest. So the forced, I think well, it's like focused, I think not forced. I mean, like, so I do tend to get obsessed with some things. And so for example, if I have a problem that I'm working on, I'll, I'll tend to get obsessed about it. And I guess that's another one of my negative traits that my fiance can tell you all about. So, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll obsess about it until I crack it or something like that. And so in terms of that, if that is what I, I am doing need to do, then I really don't have problems focusing. It's just when I solely focus on that, that everything else around me starts to become, I, I basically start to neglect other things that I should be focusing on. But yeah, this, this kind of uh, forced training, I think, I think that would be good to break me out of that. And to me, making that forced, that forced training that you're talking about, Making it into a habit, I think, is to me what I've learned is the key thing for making yourself better. Is just you know, if you if you know you have a bad habit, just make a good habit, and make sure that your bad habits every time it happens, you basically don't go through with it. Essentially, so yeah, the the, the force training would be interesting. Was this the guy that trained himself to play the piano, or Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, he wrote Blink and a number like oh. uh, David. David and Goliath. He wrote a bunch of books. I don't think, I don't remember, he has a podcast, uh, like Unconventional Thinking or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Really interesting thinker. I don't think, I don't remember if he can play the piano. He might have, I think he might have used a case example of someone playing the piano because it seems familiar. So if you, uh, this can kind of tie into one of the questions I want to ask, which is uh, what's something that you're struggling with that you could use help with and maybe uh, finding some forced focus training (laughs) regimens could be it. Uh, Yeah, that's definitely something. I would say that that I should work on personally uh, as time management. And and part of it is saying no to things. Being in such a fantastic environment, I'm at the Visa Institute, there's all kinds of things going on here. It's easy to to commit yourself too much to things. And when you do that, all the projects that you're working on, they, they really suffer for that. And so being able to get to the point where my time management 
is the, the key thing where I'm like, I'm overextended being cognizant of being close to burning yourself out and making, making all of your projects not move forward because you have too much on your plate. I think that's one of the key things that, that I struggle with. And I'm sure a lot of other people struggle with too. Do you like numbers? Are you like a numbers guy? I love numbers. Okay. Prime numbers, essentially. I like, num- I like math as well. Have you thought about adding quotas for different tasks? You have like 100% of your week and then dividing it out and then thinking whenever you make a, a decision on to add or to not do something, right. that you, you truncate it down based on, is, it, is this like a social event? Or is this uh, something that helps out my um, academia stuff? And then whenever you say yes or no, it is, I only can spend like 10% of my time. And then maybe that helps make the decision. I think that would be fantastic. So one, one issue, in, especially in science, if you're involved in research, is a lot of times, a lot of those things are dependent on your experiments. And your experiments, you know, from day to day, they're changing. So I can plan, yeah, this, hopefully I can plan all these experiments, but what if they all fail? Well, I have a deadline for a paper that I need to write. So I need to put in extra hours on that. And so there's always this reallocation of my time based on how my experiments go. And so I can't predict, you know, a a week in advance how my experiments will proceed. They could all go swimmingly well, everything works, which rarely happens. And then I'll be like, oh wow, I have all this free time. Now I can chat with you about time management and stuff like that, you know? It's just a matter of finding the right style of management for the, the particular career you're in, as well as your lifestyle. And I think that's something I'll be working on until I die, to be honest. Well, I will, uh, I'll send over some, not books, but maybe some like very uh, synthesized articles. What, what is something you wonder about that you don't have the answer to? So the example I give, you know, for people listening, uh, you probably heard this a half dozen times, which is if the Big Bang made the universe and it has a causational relationship, if I destroyed the Big Bang or stopped it, what would be here instead? And then, or what would be here if we didn't have a universe? Because I, I, maybe I played too many video games as a kid. One day, I, was, I realized that if I died, I wouldn't just respawn in another world. Because like, this is the only universe. So there's no well, like other... I mean, you, you theoretically would respawn. All your molecules would just disperse. And they, they would be respawned as other things, right? Yeah, that, I mean, uh, Neil calls, uh, like, we're all stardust. Which yeah. is beautiful, but I don't know if stardust is sentient. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I see your point. But what is, the, what is something that uh, you would love to have the answer to that you do not have the answer to? So one thing I think about a lot, and this is because I have a limited lifespan and I I might not know the answer. I probably definitely will not know the answer to this is the fate of the human race in the future. So one question I would like to have the answer to, like for example, if I was to talk to somebody that could grant my wish, I would, that's one thing I'd like to know is do humans survive? Because if you think about it, on this entire planet, with countless animals, life forms that have lived, died, become extinct, we are the only ones that have created technology and have the actual ability to escape the planet. And so, you know, an asteroid could come in next week, and then this whole experiment called Earth would just be over like that, right? Humans actually have the capability to take to protect the earth and ourselves and move elsewhere, which is something no other life form that, that we know of on earth is capable of. And so that's one question I would want to know. Do we, did, did we ever leave earth? That was, that's probably going to be my question. Hmm. I guess it kind of depends on your time scale because eventually the universe just kind of doesn't dissolve, but it like has like no energy, no heat in it. Like all the suns burn out eventually. Right. So the whole universe becomes like this dead, cold place, right? Yeah, we're all um, just huddled around the fire. I guess I mean, you, yeah. you mean in like the next thousand years, right? Like yeah, not like billions. Yeah. Right. I, I, I probably, the next like, I'd say the next like 100, to like 200 years are probably going to be pretty negative. But then after that, it's probably going to be pretty nice because like global climate change is probably going to be a bitch. <laughs> so it's not going to, but I think, I don't know, it'll be interesting. But then it's also like what, what version of humanity, uh, the, because we might evolve into something else. So I think humans aren't going to, to remain constant. We're, we're, every, every living thing evolves and will evolve into something. It's just a matter of, you know, what if we were the only intelligent life forms on the, on, in the universe? It's, it's probably unlikely if you think about probability, but 
you know, it, it is a possibility. And, and in particular, what we've accomplished as a civilization, it seems kind of sad for all of that to be meaningless, essentially, because we didn't move out of the house when it started catching on fire. Which brings up a, another book that I want to recommend. Have you ever heard of a book called Rare Earth? Who wrote it? Do you know? I believe one of the authors is Peter Ward. And there's another author as well. So Rare Earth is a great book. And it kind of walks you through the, the birth and the death of Earth as we know it from what geologists know about. Geologists and, and astronomers know about the evolution of planets, right? And, you know, the Earth goes through different phases, just like every other life form goes through phases. And there will be a point where, you know, the resources on, on Earth will be completely, will, will be diminished. And so, you know, if, if we don't look to the stars, I guess, when we have the capacity to, are we going to look to the stars when we become so resource limited due to climate change, due to whatever happens, that we're like, okay, no, we're not going to spend money on, on space exploration. Let's spend money on farming to feed ourselves, right? There's a movie um, about that. Oh, so, sorry. I like, yeah. I, I need your reaction. <laughs> That's interstellar. That was, yeah. I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting. Yeah. No, but I mean, right, right now we are, you know, we live, we live pretty well right now as humans. Uh, I, I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback for that. Not everybody on earth lives well. There's a lot of inequality globally, obviously. But if we, we if a subset of our population has a technology to, to protect the entire planet and the entire species. I think now is the time to push for that. So yeah, our conversation is veering into like, you know, space exploration and stuff like that, which is something that, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in as well. Yeah, a book I'd recommend, because I hear that the best thing to do right before bed is to read a fiction book, like mm -hmm. something that's not, I, I say that it's like the last like seven days I've been reading nonfiction books, which is probably why it's been hard for me to fall asleep. But the, it's a book called Ice Pushers by uh, I think it's Stephen Baxter and the, the I'll say the premise and then sure. I don't know if I can say the premise. Do you, I, I'll spoil it a little bit. I'm sorry. So the basic idea is the, the moon, one of the moons of Saturn, I think sh starts like shooting off like a, like a ship, like go like flying away and a spaceship was grabbing ice uh, in the vicinity. So then like they land on it to be like, Hey, what the hell are you doing moon? Um, you're not supposed to do this. And then they, they get, they basically accelerate at the speed of light. Uh, I enjoy books with sci-fi books with a bit of time dilation thrown in there. I'll definitely check that out. Last question is, so I mentioned a bunch of quotes throughout the, the podcast today. Is there a particular science quote or quote that you love that you'd like to leave us on? Quote that I would leave the audience with is probably one, one everyone has heard, but it's, it's kind of one that I try to live by. And that's chance favors the prepared mind. And I believe that was Louis Pasteur. And you, we were talking about Pasteur Avenue earlier and all that. But it really drills down to the core of improving yourself and making sure that you're always learning new things uh, is the only way for you to kind of, at the right moment in the future, when, when you're in a, something where you have a, an opportunity to do something great, you have all of the resources there that you need because you've been training yourself, essentially. And so this whole constant improvement, constant learning thing i think is really encapsulated in, in, in that that quote and that's that's one thing i love about that quote is it, it tells you you know life is a process you better be you better educate yourself be prepared learn all you can because good things will happen bad things will happen but as long as you're armed with with that knowledge then you have the best chance of making sure that the outcome is good and that was peter from the vis institute remember to check him out in the show notes at the vis institute you know, if you can set a Google alert for this guy, I think you're going to, I think the future is going to be really bright for him and what he's going to be developing. It's going to be amazing. So follow along, show him support, send him an email, tell him how much you like this, this podcast, or at the very least, you know, let me know if you like this or if you want to see more of this type of content. Thank you for staying around today and I will cue you out with my outro. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell this year, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.